Is a new player rising in Asia? Kazakhstan hosts two crucial summits where Turkey also hopes to play a leading role. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Ali Mustafa and this is Straight Talk. Kazakhstan. It's a country that rarely gets mentioned in the news, despite being larger than all of Western Europe combined. It's sandwiched between Russia on one side and China on the other, but many don't realize that Kazakhstan and Turkey share blood ties spanning back centuries. And this bond continues today. Turkey has helped Kazakhstan's recent rise to become the go-to place for diplomats and heads of state. With the recently concluded OIC summit and the Syrian peace talks, is Kazakhstan looking to play an even larger role? Osman Lone explains. It was supposed to be a summit on science and technology. Instead, the floor was dominated by the violent crackdown in Myanmar, which a senior UN official has called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. The president of Turkey weighed in. <laughs> It was a concern also shared by other leaders at the summit, hosted by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan. The UN's human rights chief went so far as to call the treatment of Rohingya Muslims ethnic cleansing. Myanmar rejected those accusations, saying, it is fighting Rohingya militants and denies it is targeting civilians. But Myanmar isn't the only issue keeping politicians busy in Astana. In the last few months, it has hosted five sessions aimed at reaching an accord in Syria. Those talks began in January. They were brokered by Turkey, which backs the opposition, and Russia and Iran, which support the regime of Bashar al-Assad. I am confident that the Astana meeting will create the necessary conditions for all concerned parties to find a suitable solution. The guarantor states plan to review and map out de-escalation zones in Idlib, Homs and Eastern Ghouta, along with negotiating prisoner exchange programs. UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura has hopes for a serious negotiation. I am confident, and we are pushing for that, and we are working also for that, that there will be a non-conflictual solution for the, let's say, not a new Aleppo in Idlib. That's what we want to avoid at any cost, if we have learned from the past. And to do so, I hope and believe that the next meetings in Astana will be helping. Emotions have been high with the opposition stating there is no meaning for peace talks without a ceasefire. To put a real tools and mechanisms to observe the violations in, uh, in a way will, will stop this massacres and the crimes the, the Assad regime is doing. But as we enter the sixth round of talks, Bashar al-Assad's role in a future Syria still stands out in the eyes of many as the main obstacle to finding peace. Osman Lone, Straight Talk. And for the recently concluded Syrian peace talks in Astana, we're joined by TRT World correspondent Andrew Hopkins from there. Andrew, give us the latest on the peace talks. What was achieved? A breakthrough to some extent of the peace talks here in Astana in Kazakhstan, uh, but probably not quite the full deal that many people were hoping for when negotiations started on Thursday. The three guarantor powers, Russia, Turkey and Iran, have agreed to now go ahead and create these uh, for the escalation zones inside Syria. These are areas where about two and a half million people are living. There's going to be no fighting there, hopefully, and also humanitarian aid will be allowed in unimpeded. It seems they've all agreed on the maps for these four areas, but there's still some disagreement for one zone in Idlib about how the ceasefires there will be monitored and enforced, about where these security forces will come from, how many there will be, and who actually will be involved. But despite all this, Kazakhstan, the host country, the former Soviet Republic, is regarding these talks as something of a triumph. It's gradually increasing its profile in the international stage. 
has just finished hosting Expo 2017, a major exhibition of business, finance and energy, and was also the first host of the Organization of Islamic Conference Science and Technology Summit. Thank you for that, Andrew Hopkins joining us from Astana. And for more on Kazakhstan's regional ambitions, we join the studio by Ozge Noor Oyuchu, who is an analyst at the Center for Your Asian Studies. Thank you for coming into the studio, Ozge. Why is Kazakhstan positioning itself as a global center in this region in Central Asia right now? Uh, if you follow the um, latest uh, foreign policies of Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan doesn't only want to be a regional actor anymore. Kazakhstan would like to position itself uh, more uh, in a broader context. The Kazakhstan wants to be a global actor, and therefore Kazakhstan was interested in becoming a non-permanent uh, non member of the United Security Council, and Kazakhstan hosted the Expo uh, 2017 recently in August in Astana. And also, Kazakhstan is in, in Kazakhstan initiated the Astana talks in order to uh, create a common uh, ground for uh, different actors uh, in Syria at the moment, and Russia, Turkey, and Iran, namely. And therefore, Kazakhstan is more looking up to ways to balance the influence of different actors in the region, namely Russia, China, and some other actors. Um, in this context, Kazakhstan is also aiming to become one of the most 30 developed countries Tell us in the global about sense. Central Asia broadly. These are yes. former Soviet states, Soviet yes. republics. They're, they've been independent for over 20 years now. Yes. What is going on as far as the regional trends which are leading Kazakhstan to take this position right now? Uh, maybe it's better to talk about the recent initiative of China, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. Um, uh, Russia is uh, the main partner for Kazakhstan still, which is uh, publicly stated by Kazakh leaders several times. And uh, the partnership between Russia, Kazakhstan and other Central Asian countries is still very important for both parties. However, um, there should be also balance in the region. In, in this context, uh, China initiated One Belt, One Road project. Basically, uh, China initiated this project in order to diversify its transit roads, transportation roads, as well as the energy corridors uh, to connect European markets together with the Chinese markets. This is a new initiative and this is a great opportunity for Central Asian countries considering the fact that these countries are landlocked countries and uh, they are in between two powerful countries, Russia and China. And currently, the trade uh, between Turkey and Central Asian countries are being conducted via land roads going through Iran. However, this new Iron Silk Road, the railways, uh, are faster, cheaper, and uh, safer. And therefore, China is investing a lot in this context, considering the energy resources and increasing demand of China for new energy resources, transportation corridors, regional connectivity, uh, projects and everything, the importance of Central Asian countries is increasing in general. Ozge Noor Oyuchu, thank you for coming in thank and you. for your insights. Thank you. Still to come on Straight Talk, is a new great game afoot in Central Asia and where does Turkey fit on this chessboard? We look at Ankara's play. And what's Turkey's energy strategy in Central Asia? And could Kazakhstan play a crucial role in these plans? You can't talk about Central Asia without referencing the Great Game. A centuries-old battle between two vast empires over a landlocked region. The winner would eventually get the spoils of what would become some of the richest resources in the world. But today, replacing the British Raj and Tsarist armies are a new set of players. And Turkey might be looking to get into the mix, as Aisha Jamal explains. Central Asia and Afghanistan have often been a playground for foreign powers. The British and Russian empires rivaled for influence over the region for almost a century, in what is called the Great Game. Some say there's a new Great Game in the region, but the main players are now Russia, China, and the United States. 
The rivalry used to be about sovereignty, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, the so-called New Great Game is about the scramble for energy resources. So what do all these powers want in Central Asia? Well, Russia wants to maintain its dominant influence in the region. And China's main goal is to pave the way for investments in energy and logistical facilities. For the US, the region is a valuable part of its war on terror, and it wants to diminish Russian and Chinese influence. But there's one more country that has strong ties to Central Asia, Turkey. It's tried to exert soft power influence there, especially in Kazakhstan, which is an important player in the new great game. Kazakhstan tries to maintain balanced politics, keeping good relations with everyone involved. The country has strong ties with Russia due to its Soviet past, and China has been heavily investing in the region. But Kazakhstan, which is where the Turkish people rose in history, also has strong cultural ties with Turkey. The Kazakh people are Turkic, and so is their language. Turkey was the first to recognize Kazakhstan after its independence, and the two have worked closely ever since. They're political allies with a trade volume of $2 billion, which they're trying to increase. Recently, Kazakhstan and Turkey made agreements involving $590 million worth of investment. As the most prosperous region in Central Asia due to its oil and gas revenues, the great powers are mostly interested in the region for economic and security reasons. But Turkey's interests go beyond that. It wants to revive historical, cultural and religious links, and that goal seems to be mutual on both sides. And to discuss this further, I'm joined by Eric Wahlberg from Toronto. He's the author of Postmodern Imperialism, and his new book is called The Canada-Israel Nexus. Thank you for joining us, Eric. It almost sounds like a cliché, but the idea of the great game, or the new great game, 150 years after the term was coined, is it still relevant today? Absolutely. And as much as the world is spinning, it's still uh, a geopolitical world. And uh, the great game was called that because it was between Russia and, and Britain in Central Asia, in Afghanistan and in India. Now, it's shifted slightly, it's broadened. And it's uh, taking in other nations as well, other big imperial powers. Of course, in the first place, the United States, which uh, became the uh, really sole world superpower with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So uh, th this new great game really was inaugurated in 1991. And uh, the new uh, controlling uh, um, kind of the leading uh, actor, the leading player is the United States. Uh, Russia is out of the game and uh, Britain is out of the game. You're talking about Russia being out of the game and originally the idea was for more regional influence or controlling more territory, creating Afghanistan as a buffer for between the British Empire and the Russian empires. What is the current so-called great game being contested over? Well, it, you see, the Central Asia is really ground zero for the world because uh, the major landmass in the world is Eurasia. And uh, Central Asia is at the heart of that. It also has uh, a lot of energy resources, a lot of minerals, and it's uh, the uh, crossroads, the Silk Road that joins China with Europe. That's traditionally what it's been, and that goes back for even uh, four or 5,000 years. So uh, you can't say that this is passé. Now, and I wanted to correct myself, Russia's not completely out of the game. Uh, we'd have to have a long talk to uh, explain the way the great game shifted into uh, a battle against communism. And with the collapse of communism, Russia became very weak. But it's still a powerful anti-imperialist force. There's also China, which has this grand uh, project of reviving the Silk Road. And you have Turkey with historical ties to Central Asia. Can you expand on the role of China and Turkey here? Yes, well, China, of course, this uh, goes back uh, thousands of years, its role. And now with its new kind of mix of communist capitalism, a kind of state controlled uh, capitalist development, it is becoming really more powerful. I would say, in a sense, it's more powerful economically even 
than the U.S. today because of its uh, uh, consolidation around uh, a strong state that uh, is able to uh, keep the uh, interests of the people close enough to it to uh, legitimize it. Now, this has been a little bit of a uh, rocky period for Turkey, but uh, over Syria there were some, I think, some serious miscalculations that created a, a very serious uh, uh, disturbance to this positive future. But I think this is uh, re-establishing uh, now. I, I'm very optimistic that the new relations with Kazakhstan, and improve, which helps improve the relations with Russia. That's a wonderful trio, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Turkey. So I'm really hopeful that this will consolidate uh, in the next few years. Eric Wahlberg, fascinating stuff. Thank you for joining us from Toronto. In the 19th century, global powers scrambled for control of territory and establishing buffer zones. But today, the battle for Central Asia is centered around one thing. Resources. Hundreds of billions of dollars worth. Who stands to gain from the extraction and transportation of these riches? And what stake does Turkey have in all of this? Adil Halim explains. This agricultural company in Turkey's Izmir is ramping up for increased production. We are uh, making some exports to Kazakhstan, but uh, it's a little bit far away in logistic terms uh, and you cannot uh, reply to the, the demands at, uh, very quickly. To meet increasing demand, Agribest is setting up a crop protection chemical facility in Almaty. It's one of four investment agreements worth nearly $600 million being signed between Turkish companies and finance group Kazakh Invest. We are going to invest about 33, uh, sorry, $32 uh, million investment we are going to realize. Uh, you can say that it is a small percentage of the total package, but in terms of value that we are going to create in the Kazakh farmers, it's going to be huge. These are the images that symbolize the relationship between Turkey and Kazakhstan, where resources travel through here towards global markets. It's helped by the fact that both countries have large Turkic populations and a shared heritage of culture, language, and history. Turkey was the first state to recognize Kazakhstan after it declared independence in 1991. The country is Central Asia's economic engine, generating 60% of the region's GDP, largely through oil and gas. Kazakhstan is one of Turkey's strongest trading partners, a relationship that's likely to strengthen even more through transnational projects, as Turkish companies look to Kazakhstan as a launching pad to Eurasian and Central Asian markets. China's One Belt, One Road initiative is designed to connect several Eurasian countries, through the China-Central Asia-West Asia corridor running from Western China to Turkey, going through Kazakhstan. Similar to goods along the Silk Route, oil flows between the countries through the near 1,800 kilometer long BTC pipeline. In the past five years, Turkish companies have signed 18 investment deals in Kazakhstan and there are 10 more due to come. Turkey's investment in Kazakhstan has now surpassed the $2 billion mark. Azmimiz bunu bir an önce süratle daha önce de görüştüğümüz gibi 5 milyar dolara ulaştırmak. Abaji says Agrobest New Deal will increase safety for Kazakh farmers and the environment by complying with European standards. Yeah, efficiently, safely and more sustainable way. And it hopes plowing into the world's largest landlocked country will open the doors to the rest of Central Asia. Adil Halim, Straight Talk. And to discuss Central Asia's energy potential and what's in it for Turkey, I'm joined from Moscow by Dr. Kerem Haas. He's a professor at Moscow State University, specializing in Turkish and Russian energy interests in Central Asia. Dr. Haas, why is Central Asia so important when it comes to Turkey being a viable transit option for energy into Europe? Uh, so Turkey's geography, geography location uh, is very much important uh, be, be, for the different uh, energy routes uh, that can lie from the north to the south and uh, from the east to the west directions. 
and in that sense approximately as you know 70% uh, of the global energy reserves are located uh, around the Turkish territory you know uh, and in that sense also Central Asia is a crucial region uh, to transfer the energy resource in the region to the global markets and specifically here uh, the, uh, the countries that are landlocked uh, like Kazakhstan and some other countries like uh, Turkmenistan are needed in Turkey to transfer their energy resource to the global markets. Uh, for example, if you look at the st statistics, uh, Kazakhstan uh, has a share uh, of a nine percent in Turkey's uh, oil import, and is now, uh, for many years, is transferring uh, its oil reserves to the global markets uh, through Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline. You know. Uh, and uh, and also on the other hand, Kazakhstan's uh, Kazakhstan and uh, Russian companies are having negotiations to transfer the natural gas uh, from Ka Kazakhstan to uh, Turkey by uh, through Russian territory. And you mentioned the Central Asian countries. Russia itself is a monolith, is a huge energy-producing country, both gas and oil. How does it view all these developments to get Kazakh, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijani oil and gas to Europe by Turkey? Uh, sure that uh, the, the, the energy reserves uh, of Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan are not the major uh, game changers in the global energy industry. These three lateral mechanisms like uh, Turkmenistan, Turkey, uh, Kazakhstan uh, and also including Azerbaijan uh, gives an opportunity for the partners uh, to transfer their, uh, to diversify their energy routes, uh, not only to the Europe, but uh, also the other uh, the, the countries in the world. Dr. Kerem Haas, thank you for joining us from Moscow. которые в кузге курмбит, глазам не видно. Но это ритуальные. Вот. Как Господь Аллах дал черной магии тысячу вариантов делать ритуальные порчи, так и нам дал он белым. А обратно, аудару, казахи говорят, аудару, переводить молитвами на, на то, что покажут они, аудару жверю. И в один прекрасный день, я помню до сих пор, в, обеденное, в обед я лежал на диване и слышу голос. Не джатрасами, тур. Что ты лежишь? Вставай. Я испугался вообще, знаешь, вот родом на диване, он говорит, черги вот родом, ножись, на, садись на пол. Холланд до кутер говорит, руки поднимай. Я поднял руки, и он мне говорит, голос, проси прощения у Господа, у Аллаха проси прощения, что ты, вот, ну, не стал принимать хасиет. И я начал вспоминать мамины рассказы, что один дедушка там костоправом был, другой мечеть держал, имам был, другой был бахсе, помогал людям, очищал. И я это вспомнил. Господь сказал, и создал я вас разных по цвету кожи, национальности и вероисповеданию, но от меня у вас у каждого с душа. Поэтому человек был, должен быть добрый. Чаще всего проблема это здоровье, Закрыты дороги, не могут выйти замуж, жениться, родить детей. Мои ангелы, да, они мне ложат информационно, информационно. Показывают, бывает, на мне показывают, диагностика идет на мне. У человека желудок болит, мне желудок поддавливает. У человека печень болит, печень колет, поддавливает. Вот. Диагностика через меня идет, бывает так. Бывает, просто информация кладут. Человек пришел, говорит, вот так, вот так, очищение. Вот. Единственное, что хочу пожелать всем, всем людям, чтобы все мы давали установку на позитив.
So why does Central Asia matter? To the average person, it's a collection of post-Soviet states ending in Stan. But anyone who misses the strategic importance of this critical region will be missing out on a new great game and its outcome. For nearly two centuries, Central Asia suffered under Russian and then Soviet domination. Stalin implemented a brilliant but sinister strategy of divide and rule that would sow the seeds of discontent for decades. A brutal policy of russification also followed that is only now being slowly reversed. The fall of the Soviet Union left a power vacuum. It was an interesting time because people started questioning who they were. And this created an opportunity for Turkey. But the relationship Turkey has tried to foster and forge is one of collaboration, not coercion. Ankara's interests go beyond money and minerals. It's a question of shared identity. Some ask if Turkey has the means to achieve its grand ambitions. But a more pertinent question might be, is Turkey the better partner for Central Asia to help it realize its true potential? Tell us what you think on hashtag Straight Talk Online. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Ali Mustafa. Until next time, Hoshakalin and goodbye.